Thank you very much and uh, good morning. Um, we're going to talk about, so we decided to do this as a joint adventure because we thought I do, I deal with the research part of the human and uh, Alberto will then provide the real world situation. What we think about in the clinical research world is not necessarily as obvious in the clinical world. These are actually pictures that I found and that people have how they describe their pain in an art, artistic way. Let's see. So chronic pain in general is really one of the most underestimated healthcare problems in the world today. And one of the reasons for that is that you can't see it on the outside. So you have to pretty much trust the person on it, whether they have pain or not. And in specifically in spinal cord injury, it's a very complicated problem, especially the type of pain we're going to talk about today, the central neuropathic pain, uh, where very few treatments actually have any significant effect. And if they do, it's more of an anecdotal type of, of situation. So one of the, this is actually the definition of pain. I, I usually show this because it just emphasizes that it's both sensory part and an emotional experience. So we suffer from pain um, and that's why we have so much influence both of sensory parts and uh, psychological parts. Um, so if we look at the brain, for example, we can see that pretty much the whole brain is involved in the pain experience. And the frontal parts of the brain are more of the emotional aspects. Um, and some of the, the somatosensory cortices is more of the sensory parts and they're all interconnected. So that makes it a little interesting to study. So why do we have to <laughs> classify it and sort it while well, it is because it has implications for how we treat it. So uh, before, I would say before this, uh, this type of uh, classification came out, um, which was in, which year was it? 2012. There were many different, there were four different classifications of pain. And with the small patient population that we have, um, it was difficult to compare studies from different places because they all use different definitions and classifications. So this is the official one actually. Uh, and it's, as you can see, it's like two broad uh, types and that's nociceptive and neuropathic pain. <clears throat> the two other categories there is really other pain, which means pains that people can have, uh, but it's not necessarily, uh, we don't know the mechanisms. We know the name, there's a name for it. Um, but so, so one example could be fibromyalgia, for example. So this classification, what's different about this classification compared to many other pain classifications is that includes all the pains that someone with spinal cord injury can have. And there's a practical reason for this. It is because when you go to a rehab doctor, which they usually do, um, you don't want to treat only one kind of pain you want to be able to get treatment for all your pains at the same time. And people, unfortunately, have a lot of different types of pain. So what we're going to talk about today is really the at-level and below-level neuropathic pain, which we also call the central neuropathic pain. We have also within the US and internationally there is an, has been an effort to actually classify all pains, not just spinal cord injury, but have, the, have them fit into a specific framework. And these are the, the diagnostic criteria for central neuropathic pain. Central neuropathic pain you find in spinal cord injury, you find it in post-stroke uh, pain, and you find it in MS. Those are the main groups. There are probably other groups too, like TBI, for example, and some other maybe um, trigeminal neuralgia. So, um, so the first simple thing is, of course, for this pain, you have to have a spinal cord injury if it is a spinal cord injury neuropathic pain. 
And then there are some specific, um, these are like international uh, consensus guidelines. So um, it's usually onset at the time of spinal cord injury or up to a year after. If it starts later than that, one could suspect that there's some other reason for it. Um, the pain duration um, is at least three months. Um, and of course, pain has to be in an area which you would expect based on a spinal cord injury. It also has some sensory changes, which is why we assess sensory changes in research and in clinical care. So if we look a little bit at the prevalence, there are not that many prospective studies uh, that follow people from, from the onset of injury. Um, this is a study from, um, from Ananefinrup in Denmark. And we can see there that the pain that actually increases, that is relatively low prevalence in the beginning, is below level neuropathic pain. It seemed to slowly develop over the first year. Whereas the at level seemed to be pretty much the same way the whole, whole time. So, but if we look at the, the prevalence of pain, of any pain, it's 80%. So that means that people don't have only one kind of pain. That's something we have found. They have one or two or three types of pain at the same time. And that's why we have to classify it so that each pain can get the appropriate treatment. So from our studies and others, the most common ways that people describe this pain is burning, pins and needles, tingling, electric shocks, numbness, hot burning, pricking, sharp, stabbing, shooting, lacerating, squeezing, and aching. Those are the most common words. So if we look a little bit again at the pain experience, so, like we mentioned before, there are sensory aspects to this. And there you have like the nociception, the activation of nociceptors. Uh, you have mechanisms related to peripheral sensitization. You can have a phenotype switch of the neuro neuron, so that a neuron that previously transmitted maybe tactile sensation now is transmitting um, pain sensation. Um, we have central sensitization, which is something that's common to a number of different types of pain. Um, there's increased facilitation so that the pain signal can, in, can reach the brain quicker. Um, there's also a lot of plasticity and it could be decreased inhibition. So these are many different types of mechanisms that we have known for quite a while. The problem that we have is that we don't know in each person which mechanism is it, and that's where the, the field is trying to, to move to actually target treatments to specific mechanisms. When it comes to psychosocial factors, these are just examples of the different psychosocial factors that can affect the pain experience. That is, have you had pain before? What do you expect? What do you think about the pain? Is it something that uh, you think is going to be there the whole, your whole life? Is it something that you think is going to go away? Uh, do you have anxiety, depression? How is your attitude? Do you have a lot of resilience? Some people do, and especially in this population. Uh, and they are able to, to deal with these difficult, very difficult pains. Uh, social influence can be positive or negative. Uh, and there's also cultural influence. So there's a number of factors that can actually affect. So if we look at, let me see here if I can do this. Which one is the, no, oh, yeah. that wasn't right. <laughs> okay, we'll have to do it like this. So uh, one recent uh, paper that we have that is actually right now, I think it's imminent that we're gonna get it accepted. We have done a qualitative study and we have identified um, barriers to optimal pain management based on people's um, perspectives. So this is now from the consumer, the spinal cord injured person's perspective. So um, a lot of people have, so the bigger font to this, the bigger is the concern. So medication concerns, is a huge 
concern in this population. People are afraid of addiction, they're afraid of adverse effects, and also they feel like it's not worth it to take a medication if it has minimal effect and has a lot of, of side effects. There also seem to be an inadequate access to information and expertise. So uh, people have limited information regarding pain. Uh, they don't have a lot of uh, uh, healthcare provider expertise. And the reason is that many people are not, of course, in the areas where we have big spinal cord injury centers. So they may be out in a place where they have a primary care physician that has only one patient with spinal cord injury. And you can't expect that that person is going to be an expert. So very often they feel like they have to educate their healthcare provider. Also, there is a common concern is that they don't feel like they have access to preferred care. So they feel like the insurance coverage are not really covering many of the things that they want. Like, for example, non-pharmacological options, which is something that a lot of people want to have access to and I guess covered by insurance. Um, they do a lot of things themselves. They, they stretch, they change positions, they rest, they try all kinds of different things. Some people are really, really good at it. And they even think away the pain, which is amazing. Say some person told me, say, that I put the pain here. And I even have a name for it. I don't remember what the pain, what the name was, but, and you know, I say don't bother me, and they are able to do that. So it's rather amazing the people what they do. Um, so people want to better understand and communicate about pain. So uh, it's important to get more increased knowledge. There's a lot of information about or available to people with spinal cord injury. Uh, but not so much about pain, strangely enough. So that's one of the things that we are developing right now too. In fact, we have a, a beta version. Um, there's also um, very important to have, um, be able to have this resilience and distraction abilities. Uh, some people obviously use pharmacological options. Uh, the most common is gabapentin, pregabalin and opioids, and many people also use NSAIDs and cannabis. Um, social support is considered to be very important as well. So if we look at the significant other family members, we also interviewed them, um, and they have very similar concerns as their significant others. The only thing that they don't or, or a few things are different. And one is that they feel like their significant other is resistant to their suggestions. And maybe that is based on that many people with spinal cord injury who have pain, they think that nobody understands what they're going through. Um, otherwise, I think it's very, very similar. We have uh, one of those uh, also for for healthcare providers, and that's something that, that Alberto will talk about, what the healthcare provider's perspectives are. Um, these are the recent, they're actually from 2016. Um, they're being currently updated right now, um, but it's really the evidence base for treatments in this population for this type of pain. And right, and at that point, most evidence was available for pregabalin, gabapentin, and tricyclic antidepressants. That was the first line of therapies. This committee is consisting, it's, it's a lot of people from Canada. It's a Canadian initiative, but there are also a lot of other people from the US and from other parts of the world that are part of this committee. Um, the second line therapies, tramadol, lamotrigine. Um, third line therapies, here comes some of the non-pharmacological like uh, transcranial direct current stimulation and plus visual illusion, although the, the evidence there is very limited. So we also have the fourth line therapies, transcutaneous electrical stimulation. Here comes the, the, the opioid oxycodone and dorsal root entry zone lesioning is very exceptional and there was a lot of um, controversy when that particular aspect was discussed in the committee. 
Uh, so, so in some countries that is banned, they're not allowed to do it, like in Denmark, for example. Um, so they don't do it at all because of the risk of, of uh, increasing the, the, the impairment. That role is, you know, that's something that that should be ex exercised, should be researched more too. But, and they want to do that. And some people do it and they say that it does help them. But it's so many different types of exercise. So we don't know exactly which type of exercise is it. Is, is that how we should do the study? That we have people, maybe that's the way we should do the study. Have people do whatever exercise they like, you know, instead of trying to standardize it. I mean, that's the problem with, with the research. We need to standardize things in order to, <laughs> to get funded. Um, and in the real world, that's not necessarily how, how a physician would prescribe it. So there's definitely a lot of room for, for uh, um, I was going to say exercise, a lot of room, it certainly is, but a lot of room for, for more research in this area. So we know that these types of pains are really poorly managed, um, despite that there are lots of, of available uh, treatment options. They're very difficult to manage. Uh, and it's probably because there are so many different mechanisms. Uh, and hopefully, um, the most rational uh, approach is to identify the pain generating mechanisms and tailor the treatment to this. And that's really where the field would like to go, but that's easier said than done. Um, and like I said before, that because we don't know in each individual person what is the mechanism rather than just saying that this person has nociceptive, this person has neuropathic pain, which is not necessarily all that informative with respect to mechanisms. So one thing one can look at is to look at neuropathic pain phenotypes. That's one way that have been suggested to, to look at where you can actually sort of classify people based on their sensory profiles. Um, and that has been done uh, by our lab, but also by a number of other things and other labs. And uh, there's a, a lot of uh, different types. And the question is here too, is can we, can we link this to a particular mechanism? So one method that have been used a lot for this, and we have used it too, is quantitative sensory testing. And in using this method, you can actually identify sensory profiles, um, in including then thermal and mechanical types of stimulation. And I'll show that right away. So um, we've, we and other people have found that injury to the spinothalamic tract is related to the presence and or severity of neuropathic pain after SEI. And having said that, we don't actually don't know it. As you probably know, there's not just one pain tract and it's other uh, pain tracts as well. And we know that from tractotomy, for example, you do a chordotomy of the spinal cord in, or the spinal cord, which is not done as frequently anymore. Um, that pain returns. So the question is then, uh, is this pain that people have actually transmitted now via spinal, spinal thalamic tract or some other tract? We don't know that. Um, but there are lots of, of, of interesting things one can study using the, the, the QST. And if we look at this, this is one way that we're doing it. And this is, I don't know if you remember Janice Cruz, those people are matter that used to be a PhD student in my lab. Um, so we use a neurosensory analyzer and it's a computerized control device. Um, and we have then, you can measure the activity of small fiber, A delta C fiber, sensory nerve function, and also A beta fibers. Uh, and the way you can do that, you can look at thermal noxious, which is the, the which is uh, um, thermals. We use a peltier thermal. We put it on the skin, as you can see there. And the, 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 either it becomes warmer or it becomes 
cooler and then the person can report when they feel like it's a cool stimulus, when it's cold pain, when it's a warm stimulus or a hot pain. And there's also another component which is related to the, the vibration. There's another component of this system um, and that's supposedly assessing the, uh, the dorsal column function. Uh, and we also have other ways to look at that. We, for example, have done some studies where we have uh, developed a very simple bedside um, method and validated it for spinal cord injury, um, which is basically graphesthesia, where you look at number recognition on the skin or speed and direction of a stimulus. And that seemed to be very good also. So that is something that can be used in the clinic. So if we cluster, this was a paper that we did um, a couple of years ago. Liz was part of this. <laughs> um, and uh, we had actually a relatively big sample size with sensory thresholds for spinal cord injury. Most studies are relatively small and we had over 100 people. So we could then do some multivariate statistics and see, are there any phenotypes in this population? This was published in Journal Neurotrauma. Um, and we found that what actually um, contributed most to the, to the clustering of groups was actually hot pain sensitivity. It was average pain intensity. It was cool detection, cold pain catastrophizing and worm detection. So it was not really seemed to be influenced very much by the dorsal column, but primarily by the pain transmitting pathways. And we also compared them on uh, having clustered them like this. We got two groups. We got one severe neuropathic pain, one moderate neuropathic pain. Uh, and. Um, and that we looked at them with respect to a very well-established uh, neuropathic pain questionnaire, which asks about uh, symptom severity. Uh, and we find, found that uh, they significantly, the severe neuropathic pain group had significantly more burning pain, uh, paroxysmal pain, um, pressing pain, and paresthesia, dysesthesia. So if we compare this, just looking at this rather uh, superficially, one can say that it seems based on our data that the more severe pain you have, the more sensation you have. So those people who had more sparing or perhaps they had injury to the spinothalamic tract or a similar tract and had ampl amplification of the signal, which we don't know because we deal with the response in the person. So it could be either or, but those ones seem to have the most severe pain. And of course, this raises the, the issue with respect to what we do in the Miami project when we want to regenerate. Is this going to, you know, in people who already have pain, is this going to increase pain or is it not going to have any effect at all? We don't really know that, although we've looked in the in the, the last paper we published, we we saw that there weren't really any didn't seem to be an increase based on that small sample size. Although the, the patient who has the worst pain out of that initial subgroup group is the patient who's incomplete. Yes, yes. So incompleteness is uh, yeah the more sparing it seemed like it's more options or possibilities for pain. The previous one? Yeah. No, not this. You mean the... the previous, yeah. No, no, this comes from Miami Project. Oh, is that right? Yes. <laughs> from <laughs> your group. <laughs> yeah, I have it. I have the data. You can, we can look at it if you want. This is from our study. Yeah, I understand that now, but I'm looking for a big, huge, huge, huge data set of machine learning and computer you know, mm -hmm. models. Yeah. The model system doesn't collect this kind of detail information. It's mostly no. questionnaires. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we're not doing sensory testing on everyone. 
No, it, it's labor intensive. Yes, it is. It's labor intensive. Yes, yes. Uh, we, are, we can look at it because it, w it was published and we, I think we presented all of that in the paper. I just don't remember of, okay. yeah. But I'm pretty much, pretty much fol it's following this, I believe. So just um, quickly here. Um, so the question is then, can you utilize neuropathic pain phen phenotypes in clinical trials? Can you look at these phenotypes and then in retrospect at least see who responded to a treatment and who didn't respond to a treatment? And uh, then of course first you have to decide what response is to a treatment. Um, we have one number that's called number needed to treat, which is a common way to, to look at it. And it means that relative to uh, placebo, you need then a certain number of people to actually get one person with 50% reduction in pain. So um, it has been used in a couple of, this is actually from, from one of the reviews that I wrote where I just summarized uh, a, a few studies. And if we look at peripheral neuropathic pain, the first one, um, what they found was that um, if we look at the, the people who had like an irritable nociceptor, which means preserved cold, warm, pinprick hyperalgesia, which would probably correspond to the more severe pain, uh, they were very, uh, much more responsive to the sodium channel blocker because it was only the number needed to treat 3.9, which is quite good actually. Uh, so then they can infer that perhaps it's upregulation of sodium channel that is you know, associated with that type of pain. So that's how people are trying to sort of tease it out. Mm, the problems that we have in spinal cord injury is that we have small sample sizes. So it's very difficult to do these types of studies unless you have relatively good size. So uh, with spinal cord injury, neuropathic pain, there you see that study in the middle. Those people who had evoked pain there, they um, uh, responded, that were the people with no evoked pain, responded um, well to oxa, oxa, caser, I can't um, to the, the sodium, sodium channel blocker. And those pains were like typical electric burning and pricking, which is typical neuropathic pains. So, so that was what they inferred then, that it would be an upregulation of sodium channels when, when, um, when we have that type of, of symptoms. And there's one study in diabetic neuropathy also. I'm not going to go into that, but um, there they looked at duloxetine and they found that, uh, that, that certain groups there seemed to be more responsive than others and then concluded then that they had perhaps an impaired descending pain modulation. So unfortunately, for those of us who study it and who treat it, it's a very difficult problem um, and it's frequently resistant to therapy and it's probably because of so many mechanisms. And if we can determine how clinical phenotypes are associated with biomarkers and clinical trial outcomes, um, this may increase the understanding of underlying pain mechanisms and lead to better management of central neuropathic pain after spinal cord injury. And our data support the hypothesis that decreased but not complete elimination of spinothalamic tract mediated function below the level of injury contributes to central neuropathic pain and that greater spinothalamic tract sparing is associated with more severe central neuropathic pain. This is my last slide here. So I just want to sort of link what we do with the national pain strategy. Um, and here are the guidelines where we actually um, um, at, at uh, review board meetings, they bring this up and they want us to align our reviews with this. So the first one is developing methods and metrics to monitor and improve the prevention and management of pain. 
So there, of course, we need to develop more effective treatments and provide evidence base, including non-pharmacological treatment options. Um, supporting the development of a system of patient-centered integrated pain management practices based on a biopsychosocial model of care that enables providers and patients to access the full spectrum of pain treatment options. So we need to promote an integrated care model and share decision regarding treatment uh, and improve patient-provider communication. And one way to do that is to actually educate consumers and providers. Um, taking steps to reduce barriers to pain care and improve the quality of pain care for vulnerable, stigmatized and underserved populations. Um, so again, we need to provide an evidence base to improve insurance coverage. We need to facilitate access to care by education of primary care physicians, perhaps adopt health care methodologies to make it more accessible for those people who are not close to major centers. Um, and in general, increase public awareness of pain, increasing pa patient knowledge about what kind of options do they have, what are the risks, and especially now with the opioid crisis and emerging perhaps newer other treatments, more research into um, cannabis, um, and to develop a better informed healthcare workforce with regard to pain management. So we need to make material available for people will see either families and their healthcare providers um, because we think that will facilitate patient provider communication and ultimately better care. Thank you very much. And I'm going to leave it now to Alberto Martinez. Arisala will provide a real world perspective. And I am actually running off to the next meeting. It's not every day you get to meet with the Swedish ambassador of the US. <laughs> Thank you.